Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the DLI webinar for December 2022. We are live here in Louisville, Kentucky with Believers University. Y'all make some noise. Yeah, let's go. Oh man, so excited to be here. I'm here with uh, Pastor Jaron and Haley Hollis. Welcome. Haley, you had something to say, right? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Just open us up in prayer. Yeah. That would make me very comfortable right now. Thank you. Uh, we're here, uh, but Believers is a great church in the Louisville area. I've had an incredible weekend. I got to speak here on Sunday and just so excited about what God is doing. And this is such a great church for the city. And you guys are a big part of that, along with uh, your, uh, Jerry and your parents, uh, Pastor Randy and Renee Hollis, who they're sitting right over here and they're just, they're legends. We love and honor them. And thank you for letting us do this, guys. Uh, but Jerry, why don't you just introduce yourself and tell a little bit about uh, how long you've been at the church, anything else the Lord puts on your heart, you got a word, a prophecy, and tongue, yeah. interpretation, <laughs> like just whatever, whatever you've got. Yeah, well, I've been, I've been here since I was nine, just turned 10 when we moved to Louisville, Kentucky. Um, uh, essentially, my story is that I I didn't ever imagine myself being in the role that I'm in now, which is the role of the associate pastor. I, I didn't really want to be a pastor. Associate pastor, associate to the pastor. Associate to the pastor. You know, <laughs> you know what? Hey, man, it, ultimately what it comes down to is you just kind of do whatever is needed. Uh, but, I, you know, I never saw myself being here, but God has a way of surprising you. You know, God has a way of letting you say what you think is going to happen. But the second that you yield to him, and you just say, you know what, I've tried it my way long enough, uh, and it really doesn't work out too well when I do things my way. And then when you yield, when you submit, when you bend the knee, he has a way of, you know, really just redirecting your steps, redirecting which way that you go. And I never thought I would say this, but this is what I want to do with my life now. This is what I want to do with my life uh, is is serve the Lord, serve people, love people, and lead people to a fulfilled life through Jesus Christ. Uh, and I get to do it with my wife and with my family and with our awesome church, and I love it. Okay. Well, Haley, tell us a little bit about your story. Um, well, I'm the administrative pastor here at Believers. Uh, I did not really grow up in church. I grew up in a Baptist church in like middle school, so I didn't really like grow up in it. Mm -hmm. um, I started dating Jaren in 2008 mm -hmm. and just went deep dive into church life all the time. Everything I knew, I kind of changed my whole life. Um, and now we, we've been together 15 years. We have two kids um, and we just kind of eat, sleep breathe church life and we love it it's yeah. something that we love to do to work every day with people that we love to see this building grow and see the people grow and it just some, some transparency uh landon said what if we talked a little bit about rest and we're like we're not really good at that right now we we're we not just, good at that we work seven days else. a week we'll talk about something else let's not do that <laughs> Uh, well, one thing I'm excited about is uh, you guys are such are leading so strong, and I think fruit of that is Believers University, and you guys have partnered with DLI, and you are by far our largest partnership. Twenty nine students. Twenty nine, I believe. Yes. Twenty nine yep. students, which really we can just round up to thirty. There's really <laughs> no need to stand there. So tell us a little bit about about do, do we call it BU? That was yeah, really, we call it really B, you know, cool. Believers University, um, become who God created you to be, kind of uh, works with the BU. Uh, yeah. You know, God, we're real cool. clever, y'all. <laughs> so cool. Uh, we, we went to like the Destiny Conference in June uh, and we decided this would be such a great idea. We got to see the graduation of all the students uh, and we thought we could do this. We know that they're, they're trying to make it so that churches can kind of launch it themselves, but be in partnership. Yeah. And we just decided we're going to be all in. Mm -hmm. We're going to, we're going to, uh, promote it every single Sunday. We're going to promote the, the promotion of the free books. We're going to have banners and shirts made, and we're going to make this a class that people can come to once a week and we can all spend it together, not just be home, but be able to be a class, be together and really grow all together at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, the one thing that I'll say is when we started doing this, we thought, man, wouldn't it be great if we had five people? Because we really underestimated how interested the people in our church would be. Right. We thought, ah, you know what? Who's going to, you know, who in church? That's the reason people come to church is they're, they're getting their education here on Sunday morning. Who's going to want more than what we're already giving them on Sunday? Yeah. They're getting enough, right? Uh, so if you're somewhere else or if you're a leader in another church, do not underestimate 
the depths to which people want to go in their knowledge of the word of God and their relationship with God. If you will consistently offer it, I think you'll be blown away at how many people in your church say, I want to grow. I want to learn. Mm -hmm. I want to become more like Jesus. I want to learn how to lead. Uh, we were blown away and it continues to grow. And I love meeting all this, all of you guys, all the students here at the church and getting to know some of your stories. But I think one worth highlighting is Miss Linda, 76 years young. 78, bless her, come right. on. So 78, she is our, our, uh, our senior class. Um, and, like, and uh, but, but seriously, like to watch the dedication of Miss Linda at this stage in life and what, it's such an inspiration to all of us. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Grow old it. if you stop learning. Whatever looks interesting. Yes. Keep interesting. learning. That's yes. right. Love it. Well, so we are so glad to be here. And the theme of this semester is um, has been character. So we've talked a lot about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus. In the upcoming semesters, we'll talk about doing what Jesus did. And next semester, I get really excited. We talk about how you can discover the calling that God has placed in your life, find how you are gifted. But we have one more time to talk, and this is something that you're really passionate about, Jaron, is uh, about leading from a place of, of uh, walking in the fruit of the Spirit. So often we associate leadership with gifts of the Spirit, with like, what am I gifted to do? And as we've said in a few different ways this time around, uh, that really until you are the right kind of person, you doing what you're called to do that like that I would rather you be something before you try to do something and Dr. Brassett often says that we do a great disservice to people when we when we train them how to do something before we teach them who they're supposed to be um, so who are you and so we, we, we've been talking a lot this weekend as just our private conversations about leading from the fruit of the spirit and uh, a couple of re thing, reasons why is that there's always a temptation for us to lead out of our giftedness and for someone to uh, have a, a particular skill or talent and to lead from that place um, rather than from who they are. And that's a straw man, because eventually, if you grow, as we said last time, if you grow wide before you grow deep, um, you're, you're not, you're not going to make it very long. But also in, in this particular cultural moment where there's so much hostility in our broader culture, we've really kind of neglected the fruit of the spirit because we're, we're trying to win, baby. <laughs> we, we've got to make sure that our side in whether it's a cultural war or a social war or a religious war we gotta make sure our side comes out on top and it's like we we can sacrifice love and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness all for the sake of wanting to be right yeah. and so how do we lead from the fruit and so jesus is very clear that if you follow him that you will bear the fruit of the spirit in matthew chapter 7 verse 16 he says you will recognize them by their fruits. In Matthew 21, 43, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, the religious people who aren't producing fruit, and given to a people producing its fruits. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. A couple of verses later, by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so proved be my disciples. Our last webinar, we talked about how people change. We talked about you change through the stories you believe, the habits you practice, and the relationships you cultivate. Well, how do you know you've changed? Are you bearing fruit? Like, how do you know that you are different? Are you more loving? Are you more joyful? Are you more peaceful? So, uh, Jaren, maybe talk to us a little bit about that, about the importance of leading from the fruit of the Spirit and why that's such an important value to you. Well, I think one of the things that you talked about is when your when your talent essentially when your talent or your giftings get out ahead of your character right when your giftings your talents your abilities and sometimes man if our if our character isn't growing equally with our talents and our abilities i feel like we can tend to get like a big head a big ego or our our character isn't enough to match our talent and our ability I've watched way too many people, and myself included, when that isn't equally balanced, that's when you fall. That's when you get out of whack. That's when you get out of balance. When, when your, your gifting, your 
talent, your ability is the only thing you prioritize in life. I think sometimes we are confused by that. How can this person be so talented? How can this person be so gifted? How can, how can this person be prophesying? How can this person be laying their hands on other people and praying and we're seeing people be healed, but then when the door is closed, I see them and hear them gossiping about other people. How is this happening? Well, the Bible says that, you know, our, our gifts and callings from God, they remain with us at times without repentance, but that's only, count, uh, that's only counterbalanced when we are equally saying, Lord, I want to grow in my character and my nature to become like you. Keep me humble. Keep me like you because if my talents and my abilities and the gifts that you've given me are the only thing I'm prioritizing, I'm going to get top heavy (laughs) and I'm going to end up falling flat on my face. Uh, And that's not going to be good for me. That's not going to be good for anybody else that has watched my life through ministry. Uh, It could hurt people because I think we've all seen really talented, really gifted people that are doing the work of the kingdom fall and we've watched other people lose out on their faith and their relationship with God because of it. So I think that sometimes we, we have to equally prioritize or all the time we have to equally prioritize developing, cultivating the fruit of the spirit in our own life. If not more, if not more. Yeah. I think you had said, uh, I can't remember if it was in a webinar or if it was in one of the videos that you, uh, you, you wouldn't hire somebody if they had, you know, they have the big head, but they don't have the heart. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to work along somebody that I want to avoid on my day off. You know, like you see them in the store, I'm going to hide. Like, I I don't see you. I want to make sure that, that I'm, that I'm able to work with people I love. And I think I, you really want to, you want to go after people. If they've got the right heart, I can teach you something. If you've got the right heart and we can build that ability, but just because you have the ability and the knowledge first, but you don't have the heart, like that's where we need to make sure that we're we're paying attention to, and we're growing our, our heart and our confidence in who we are in Jesus before we put all of those talents first. And the reason I want to have a conversation with you two is that I've observed a little bit from afar, but even this weekend, as we've been together, um, you're both incredibly talented. Jaron, you're such a good communicator uh, and you, you have a natural leadership ability. You're wise uh, people. You just, you just are a natural leader. Good looking. It's very uh, important as well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, if, if you say so, um, but uh, Haley, uh, and you, uh, you're, I mean, even with what you've done with believers, like your administrative gift, uh, Believers University, your administrative gift, go, I mean, it's, it's very apparent and it's, it's clear that you're a rock star that's holding a lot of this together. All of it together. All of it together. Um, well, I was, gonna, I was trying to give Pastor Randy a little credit. <laughs> Me and Pastor Randy <laughs> together. Yeah. Um, but that's but what I've observed with the, those that are in this room and the broader church is that the reason why people are willing to follow you guys is because you are so humble and you're so kind. Uh, and so you're leading from a place of character. And I think what that shows is that is that people, if the if the character's right, if you really are a person of peace and a person of kindness and a person of gentleness, uh, if you really genuinely are those things, then people want to follow you. And so often, like you, you really you if you can become a better communicator. Uh, you can become uh, a better musician through practice. But many of those things are you either are or you aren't. Like those are giftings that that God chooses to give to who He chooses to give. Uh, and so often we focus on those things, those those specialty skills, and and think that that's our ticket forward. But whenever we're living in a culture that is just deplete of character. Uh, character rich leaders mm. uh, where there are so many both in the uh, political and social and religious worlds people that just don't reflect high character it's it's just it's like a commodity that we have <laughs> just to be like decent people you know like, like that 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 really draws people so I think for all of us not to overlook what I sometimes will call the baseline competencies like it's just just the the if you just do these things, you're going to be valuable to your team. You're going to be valuable to God, and it's it's having having these particular fruit of the spirit. Yeah, I think it's so important. You know, I I, I do believe that talent and 
ability and creativity can attract people, but people stay and people follow when they figure out who you are and people will figure out who you are pretty quick. So if, if you want to do life with people in the long haul, people will get over your talent real fast. They'll get over your, your, you know, the flash in the pan stuff, the wow factor really quickly. And they'll find out if the character is there. Great. We, we love you mm -hmm. and we will follow you. But if, if it's all about the bang, whiz, pow, flash, and they realize that it just doesn't hold up, if there is no love, no kindness, no gentleness, no patience, you know, people won't stick around. So as we look at the fruit specifically, Galatians chapter five, verse 22 um, it reads, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. One thing I'd like to point out is that the word fruit is singular. It's not the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> it's the fruit of the spirit. Uh, where we all, you know, there's nine gifts of the spirit, and those are allocated to each of us at different times. And you know, sometimes we have access to only one or two of the gifts, and maybe you have access to more gifts depending on the season, but the, but the gifts are separate. Like, you know, there's a different gifts of the Spirit, but there's one fruit of the Spirit. And here's why I think that the word is in the singular. It's because you don't get to pick and choose which ones you want. I want some joy and peace. You can keep the forbearance and the self-control. <laughs> you know, like, I, I want the peace of God that passes all understanding of my circumstances. I just claim the peace. What you want me to be kind to them? Uh, we don't get to just pick and choose which ones we have, but if you have one of them, you'll have all of them. Try to have joy but not have peace. Well, if you have joy, you're going to have peace. They're they're connected. So these are these this is a representative list, and there are others that are left unlisted. But the idea is simply that this is something that we have to attain all of them. Like you don't have to operate in all the gifts of the spirit all the time. But you are expected to operate in all the fruits of the spirit yeah. all of the time. That that these this isn't a pick or choose, like I like that one. And so often when we've seen this is that people kind of um I I can't be I can't be uh kind. I, I've got Irish blood. I'm just a I'm just an angry person. You know, like I uh you know me, I'm just not I'm not I'm not patient. I was, you know, or I've, I've had a hard life, so I'm not, I'm not joyful. And we think that we can go through this list and make excuses about why we can't display one or the other, but that's not how these gifts work. Yeah. I, I think that I know that in my own life, I've tried to make excuses as to why it should only come in part, yeah. whether you, yeah. it's, you have Irish blood or I can't be gentle. I'm Italian. I, you know, no matter what <laughs> it is. Italian. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you're using that. I can't, there, I can't be meek. I'm just a loud person. But I've watched people right. in my own life and I've watched as you submit and you really allow the Holy Spirit to work on the inside of you. Attributes that you said were not a part of who you are. They might not be a part of who you are, but they are definitely a part of who he is. And when you let him take control, you'll be surprised at at how much patience you have, how much kindness you want to show to somebody when they don't deserve it. Uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's amazing. I think one thing that's worth asking is that we're not saying anything groundbreaking or uh, revelatory, you know, about the need for the fruit of the spirit. But I think something that's worth discussing is what, well, how do we know whenever we are displaying. I mean, I don't think any of us will go, yeah, I'm just not very good at love or good at joy. So how, how do we know if we are growing in these areas? And I think it's, you've got to go through and just look at them one by one and then assess yourself, you know, love. It's the first one because it's the greatest. Here's the thing about love. If you, if you get love, you'll have the rest. Like it's hard, it's hard to not have joy, peace, steadfastness, gentleness, kindness, self-control if you have love. Uh, love, love, love is there. Um, joy is beyond happiness. It, it supersedes circumstances. So we can go through and look at them one, one, um, uh, one at one. But for the most part, how do we, like, how do I know if I'm growing in the fruit, bearing the fruit of the spirit? Well, I, the first challenge I think is one of self-awareness. 
being aware of who you are. And sometimes that takes you saying, you know, Holy Spirit, reveal to me the blind spots of my life. Or more importantly, if I can't see it, I think that mentorship is so important. In other words, allowing somebody to be close enough in your life, if you've got an anger problem and you've never been able to fix it and you've never been able to deal with it and you have you really struggle to manage it or keep keep account of when you just fly off the handle and go off on people because it's such a regular part of who you've become, mm -hmm. allow somebody who is mature in your life to help keep you in check. I think that one, you can, you can pray that the Holy Spirit begin to reveal those things to you, those moments, so that you can wake up to those things that, or the lack thereof. Um, but we were talking earlier about this and you had mentioned kind of what the opposite is. Mm -hmm. Like if you are struggling with, if you are struggling with, you know, patience, well, obviously, what are you developing in the place of patience? Mm -hmm. that is revealing to you that you might be in lack of mm -hmm. impatience you might have a short fuse with your kids you might have a short fuse with people at work uh, and i think that either having the holy spirit reveal those things to you or allowing mentorship into your life to point things out to you but do you have any thoughts yeah i think i think think a question to ask yourself is how do I make people feel when I walk away? Mm. So yes. do I bring them up? Do I bring them down? Do I encourage them? Do I intimidate them? Um, thinking about when you walk away, how do you make people feel when they see you coming? What kind of feeling do they get in their chest? They're like, oh yeah. no, they saw me. Yeah. Oh, I gotta, gotta walk right. fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I, see, if I see your name pop up on my phone as a text message <laughs> and my immediate thing is, oh no. This is gonna be a long one. <laughs> what do they want? You know, like that's a, that could be something in me, you know, I'm not denying that there could be a, a lack of patience in me or a lack of empathy or whatever. But if, if multiple people feel that way about you, <laughs> <laughs> then it could be a good sign that like, there's something that there's something lacking. So I think the thing to ask ourselves is, is yeah, do, do I bring joy to a room or do I take it away? Um, do I, do I bring kindness to a situation or, or, or do I take it away? And so as I look through these, I'm always thinking of, of, am I truly bearing those self-control is a big one. Like that if I'm not controlled by my impulses, yeah. but I'm, but I, I do what I'm set, what I set out to do. Uh, if I, if I make a, a commitment that I'm going to pray at 8am every morning and I miss a morning or two, that's one thing. But if I look realistically, look back at my calendar mm -hmm. and I realize I miss more days than I hit, then I can say what I want. I can make all the excuses. I can blame my kids. I can blame my wife. I can blame my schedule. But it really, it's a self-control issue. And so often I think it's just looking back at you saying being self-aware and, and generally assessing. And maybe that's not a horrible idea this weekend. Whenever you get some spare time, just take these nine <laughs> fruits of the spirit and really assess where you are if you're married ask your spouse because they they probably have yeah they may have some thoughts on yeah it. yeah and they may have a better under you know they may have a better understanding uh than you do or if there's a mentor in your life because we lead from our character and these fruits are the indications these are the indicators of our of our character one uh, one thing that might bring a little bit of clarity as to how you can self manage or you can self reflect on what what is being produced on the inside of you. Am I a patient person? Am I a kind person? Am I a loving person? I think a great way to measure what's actually inside of you, what kind of fruit is being produced on the inside of you, is your reaction mm. to a situation. Because I, your reaction is a reflection so good. of what's in you. How if you see something on Instagram and your immediate <laughs> thing because somebody said something that you don't agree with is anger, well, that's a reflection of what's in your heart. That's a reflection of what's being produced inside of you. But if it's, oh, man, I wonder how that person grew up. I wonder what they went through when they were younger. 
Well, that might be a reflection of the love, the kindness, the gentleness, the patience, mm -hmm. the forbearance, the, the willingness to be in face of a difficult person who has a different idea of what life should be than you and to be curious enough to help that person. So your, your reaction to life, to people, to situations is often a reflection of what's going on on the inside. Uh, I don't know if I've done this on a webinar before, but if I'm holding a cup of coffee and you bump into me and I spill coffee, why did I spill coffee? Because you bumped into me? No, because there's coffee in the cup. <laughs> that I spilled coffee because I had coffee in the cup. If I would have had water in the cup or juice in the cup or soda in the cup, I would have spilled that. The point wasn't that you bumped into me. It's that it's what comes out because life is going to bump into you, right? Like situations are going to happen. People are going to say things that offend you. You're going to, you're going to open up Instagram and immediately go just your anger goes like life's going to bump. And what comes out really depends on what's what's on the inside. So being a person with the fruit of the spirit, a person of kindness and, and gentleness and patience, it comes to it's, it's whenever you hear someone says, man, that person, they said something about you. Instead of your first thought going, man, they, they always talk bad about me. They're, they're always against me. You go, I wonder what the context of that actually was. Mm. I, I wonder what they meant and start assuming the best instead of assuming the worst. Uh, or, I, yeah, I, I need more. That's when people bring complaints to me uh, from church. My first thing I always say is like, what was the context? Like there's, there's, there's more than what was said. There's more than what was done. And let's interpret people's actions charitably first and, and just assume the best. And then if we find out it's the worst, then we deal with that. But assuming the best allows me to react from the fruit rather than from what, what, what's the acts of the acts of the flesh. That's really yeah. good, but that's difficult. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> that's difficult. Yes. Yeah, so, Cause we're so predisposed to, mm -hmm to expecting the worst or, or thinking the worst of people. Yeah. That is our flesh. It's pulling us mm -hmm. to the acts of the flesh, right. to everything that's listed. We want to do that. So taking that moment, you have to kind of pause and take a moment and, okay, what are the fruits? What do I need to be experiencing right now? Right. And that brings us to our next point. It's the fruit of the spirit, right? Which means that it's not our fruit. It's, it's not, not like, imagine I can tell you like, hey, here's these nine things here's what they mean. Now just go home and do those before we come back next week. <laughs> like just, you'll all get an A in everything. If you can go, if you can just show me that you've knocked out love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, self-control, you're good. But we can't do this on our own. So this, this kind of talk and teaching, it really isn't about what you're supposed to do. It's about what God has already done. It's about what's available to you by accessing a power outside it. This is why it's the fruit of the spirit. They're not your fruit. It's not your fruit. It's the spirit's fruit. So if you get the spirit, you get the fruit. And way too many of us are trying to manufacture the fruit. Yes, I'm happy. Yes, I have the joy of the Lord. Yes, I'm just so if I was any happier, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I, you know, I'm so happy. No, no, you're not. Oh, I'm, I am so patient right now. Like whenever your kids are just wrecking your, you're like, uh, I've never been more patient than I am right now to clean up this same mess for the fifth time. And whenever we try to like white knuckle it, but that only goes so far. Uh, you might notice this. This is the problem with self-discipline is you have a finite amount. That's why you drink a kale smoothie for breakfast and then go to Taco Bell for dinner, <laughs> right? Because whenever you wake up, you still got that willpower you can tap into. So you're like, I, today is a new day. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to make my smoothie. I'm going to be in a calorie deficit. And you make all those good decisions at eight o'clock at night, you've used up your willpower for the day. And so whatever's in the cabinet, you know, you go get a, you go get a, the pint of ice cream. Uh, like, so I, I speak against that <laughs> spirit right now. But willpower in itself is, isn't enough. So unless you've, and we've talked a little bit about your fitness journey this weekend as well It's like, but until you make some decisions to change your lifestyle, if it's just the sheer willpower of I'm, I'm going to do this, it's never enough that willpower comes in. A, it's, it's in a finite amount. And uh, I mean, behavioral scientists have proven this, that it literally goes down throughout the day. You have less and less as the day goes on. And that's why you're much more 
angry. <laughs> but it's you, you, you know, you lose like, for real, like my kids, I love them so much, but you put me in a car with them for 12 hours. Like I start out, like we're singing, like in this, in this family time, it's so great. We're taking a road trip, like all good American families do. We're singing songs. And like, by the end of the trip though, I'm ready to strangle somebody because that, that patience, if it's just mine, if it's just the willpower throughout the day, that, that meter gets, you know, gets more and more, and more uh, depleted. So it, it can't just be our willpower. And if we're leading from that place, especially because listen, leadership will test your joy. It will test your patience. Come on. It will test your kindness. <laughs> like it, it, it will, if everything we're talking about, it's, it's going to, what the the average Christian faces for those of us who are aspiring to serve the church at a higher level, there's a bigger pull on us. And if we're just trying to go into our own resources, uh, look at depression statistics among pastors it's through the roof, uh, because there's so much pulling at us. If it's just in our willpower, then we're in trouble. And so many of us try to white knuckle this kind of stuff. Like we just try to like we're going we're going to do better. We're going to be, uh, we're going to have more self-control. We're going to, but we have to realize it's, it's of the spirit. So the only way, the only way to produce the fruit of the spirit is to abide in the vine. And then we produce the fruit. If we're trying to produce the fruit, then we're in trouble. A tree doesn't try to produce fruit. A tree is planted, attached to the, to the river source, and the fruit comes automatically. So if you're, if you're like, man, I'm going to try to be more joyful. You're not going to have much luck with that. It's it, the fruit only comes from being planted. Yeah, I you know I I think that that's kind of a model that's been set up in the modern day church, which is the weekend experience, mm. which is you're getting watered <laughs> once a week. You're getting watered once a week, and many of us as modern day Christians, followers of Christ we don't question whether we're being watered the other six mm -hmm. and we come back out of patience, out of kindness, so out good. of self-control, yeah. out of all these things. We're, we're completely empty. We're completely dry. And we wonder why we're so broken is because we've got this once a week mentality. And here's the thing. We're expecting the source to be the, the man or the woman at the front of the building. Yeah, that's good. To fill us up again. Right. To deliver something to us. And so I think that it's this, this question of dependence. When it comes to you being dependent, what's your source? What's your source? And it should be the Holy Spirit. Mm. But it should be a continuous relationship every single day of the week. You and I were talking earlier about this, and he has an incredible analogy. It is the difference between being planted by the rivers of living water. Mm -hmm. We're all familiar with that. Or if you're not familiar with that, I'm sure as you begin to read your word, you'll become more familiar with that. Yeah. We are trees that should be planted by the river of living water. But so many of us are living more of a potted plant lifestyle. <laughs> that when our owner goes on vacation, we're just praying, I hope they get back and they can give me a drink <laughs> so before good. I completely yeah. dry out and die. Yeah. And that's what our relationship with the Holy Spirit looks like, because it's this Sunday mentality. Um, yeah, the psalmist, he says, if you're planted as a tree by the rivers of living water, you will bear fruit in your season. Like if you're planted, yeah. the fruit will come. You will. You will. But many Christians, as we said, are, are the potted plants. Like they're they're not attached to the water source. They're dependent upon someone else to be their water source. And so this is why, like you, you, you if you don't, if you miss a Sunday at church, then you're feeling, you know, like, oh man, my joy is a little insufficient. I I need I need someone. Or, or you know, like for you that are, are that are here locally, you know. Like Pastor Randy, he really like he he does it for you. Whenever he preaches, man, you you get you get your cup full. And then he brings in some guests last Sunday, and you don't even know don't even know who this guy is, and you don't know why. I mean, he was there. Why wasn't he preaching? I mean, like like what? Why did he have to bring in someone you don't even know? Uh, because why? Because you're potted plant. <laughs> not not anybody in this room, but that's the potted plant mentality of like, man, I hope they sing my song today. 
the Holy Ghost, he only falls during this song. And I, I need it. I, I need it today. I, and I need that song because that song's going to fill me up. And we all have preferences and things we like and communicators that speak to us and music that speaks to us. And, but if our mentality is, is constantly depending on someone else or on something else or on circumstances to water us and to give us life, then we're going to find ourselves in a place of great deficiency. And uh, just kind of speaking candidly to those that are studying to be leaders and, and trying to, to uh, help our churches is that our pastors really do need us to be the kind of people that are planted by the rivers of living water. Like we have enough people, uh, your pastor has enough people who's constantly coming to him for encouragement, constantly coming saying, I, I need you to pray for me, constantly coming saying, can you, can you help me with this? And look, we all go through seasons of life where we, we need someone to kind of fill us up so that we can see the fruit in our lives. But as a general rule, our churches need mature Christians planted by the rivers of water who aren't always coming with their hands out, but instead are able to say, hey, pastor, how can I help you encourage someone? Like, hey, how can I help take this load off? But if we're constantly in a place of need, I need, I need, I need, can you please pray for me? Can you please, can you please, uh, then we're not, we're not fulfilling our, our purpose. Yeah, I think the modern day terminology that we're all familiar with is you hear other church people say, oh man, I just need to be fed or I'm yeah. just not being fed here. Right. That is that potted plant mentality. And I think for many of us, if you want to find out where you're planted, ask yourself, do you find yourself satisfied from day to day in these areas? Are you feel fulfilled or do you feel like you're starving when you get to church on Sunday? Yeah. That'll tell you where you are dwelling. Another great thing here. Hey, I'm sorry. What do you have to say? Oh, well, yeah. I have so much to say. I've just been waiting for my turn. Let it out, baby. Yeah, oh, no, no, please, please continue. I'll sure? interrupt you. The only thing that I have to say is that for me, we had talked about it before that um, the illustration that I think of is the fig tree and that fig tree was alone and that kind of fig tree there, there then grew in an orchard. That's where it grew best because of cross pollination. But when he came, ac he came across it, it was alone. So are you alone? Are you by yourself? Is there so anything good. watering you? Mm -hmm. What, because your environment matters. If you want to produce fruit, what is around you? What is watering you? Where's your water source? Those are my thoughts. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Beautiful. So I, I, we got some questions coming in. I was, I was kind of looking, looking ahead to, but I love the example of, of the, <laughs> of the fig tree though, because so often we do need one another to grow in the fruit. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a huge problem in the Western church in general is that we think so much individualistically and all these things really have to be practiced in community. Like it's pretty easy to be patient if you don't have to put up with anybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty easy to have joy if no one is dragging you down. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty easy to be kind if you just be kind to yourself. I like me. It's just everybody else. Else's, you know, like it's, uh, but it's this community that, that pulls these things out of you. And that really kind of assess, you know, what's, what's in your heart. Um, so we, um, we're going to kind of get into some questions that, that are starting to come in, but I think just to kind of wrap this part up uh, uh, in Galatians a little bit later. So we've been reading Galatians five. If you look at the next chapter, Galatians six, Paul says something very interesting in verse two, he says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Great. We get that. If you have a burden, I help you carry it. Uh, then in verse uh, six or uh, verse five, he says, for each one should carry their own load. Wait, verse two, carry one another's burdens. Verse five, each one should carry their own load. <laughs> like that's like, Paul, you could have at least like tuck that away a few chapters later, <laughs> you know, like, so that we're not, what do you mean? It's, it, but as I re researched and, and dove into this, it essentially says that that a burden is something that is literally too heavy for you to carry alone. That like you can't carry a burden by yourself. It's too much for one person. A load may be heavy, but you could be expected to carry it. A, a burden is like a big boulder. A, a load is like a backpack full of books or, or rocks or something. So here's the idea is that there are seasons in life where each of us needs some help. 
Like we need someone. You're going to go through seasons of life where you're going to need someone to walk alongside you. I've been in seasons like that. You guys have been in seasons like that where there's just what, what you're carrying at that time is too big for you. You need people to come alongside and support you. But then everything else, you got to carry it yourself. And I'm afraid for what's happened in, in many church circles is that we've created codependency on church leadership where we expect people not only to carry our burdens, but also to carry our loads. So we don't feel responsible for keeping our own joy, our own peace, our own patience. Instead, we think it's your job or someone else's job to do that for us. Um, it's like, pastor, can you pray for me? Well, yeah, I am going to pray for you, but you know, you can also pray for yourself. <laughs> like, like, you know, you, you know, you have the same access to God that I do. Like he doesn't like, I don't have him on speed dial. He didn't take my calls before he takes yours. Like we we're on the same level here. Uh, you know, Hey, can you, can you help? Like, can you help me financially? I'm a little behind this month. Yeah, I can. Uh, but let's talk about how you're spending your money because I helped you last month too. And so if I keep carrying your load for you, then I'm not, I'm not helping you. You've at, at some point you're going to have to carry your own load. Can you? And, and so often as those that are, that are trying to aspire to leadership, like the biggest thing that we can do is just to carry our own load. <laughs> and when we carry our own load, then we have the ability to kind of help carry some other burdens. But if we're constantly saying, oh, this is too much for me. Can, can you help me? Can you encourage me? Can you, uh, you know, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Like sometimes I need you to encourage me. And sometimes I just spend going to my prayer closet and not come out until I've prayed myself happy, right? Like, I, like there's just sometimes that that's not something that I need you to do for me. It's something that I need to do for myself. And that is the planted by the rivers of water part. That's the, that's the bearing fruit because I'm planted, not because I'm always relying on someone else. Well, it, it, the Bible also says that, you know, when we are full of the spirit, that we have this promise that out of your belly, shall flow rivers of living water what is not just not just what you're planted in but what is actually inside you and i think that we kind of misunderstand this word in the western world independence we think of that word as i am alone mm -hmm. the way that i look at it is you are dependent on what is inside of you independence means being dependent on what is inside of you and if there's nothing inside of you guess what you are alone if he is not in you, moving and living through you, you are alone. But if he is inside of you, there are things that you never carry truly alone. There are things that you and God carry together. And then there are things that you and God and others carry together. And learning that there are codependencies, and then there are independencies or interdependencies. At least that's the way that I think about it. Awesome. We got some questions that are starting to come in that we will we'll address. Uh, I think Haley has all the answers here. She does. Yep. Yep. Let me hear them. These I'm are. ready. Uh, but before we do that, I, I want to wrap up our conversation by saying one thing that I think is insightful is uh, you guys remember the expression, the fruit of the womb, not the fruit of the looms. Like you guys know that. Little bit, uh, the fruit I of the womb. I thought that's what you said. <laughs> yes. Just a second. <laughs> The fruit of the womb is, is offspring. It's your children, right? And the reason why we're, we say that is because it's like our kids, unfortunately, for my kids, they're they're just like us, right? Like they 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 resemble us because they come from us. They're they're our our fruit. My seven year old, she is identical to me. Like she is every time she does something, my dad's just like told you, you know, like this is what I had to deal with. Uh, she has this real cutting sense of humor. So the other day we were um, we were playing this game on the trampoline and they would say something mean to me and I would jump real high and knock them over. And uh, like, that's, I don't know, maybe I, nobody got hurt in case there was a social worker watching. Like it was, it was like, we have a net, like, like everyone, like, like it's, it's completely normal. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, my, my youngest one, she's very naive. She's very innocent. And so she's like, she's like, daddy, you're mean. I love mommy more. You know, like that's just like what you would expect a five-year-old who's trying to insult you to say. Not my seven-year-old. She's like, hey, dad, uh, as many of you know, uh, I'm a pastor at Grace Church and our, our original location, Humble, is, our, is by far our largest location. It's much bigger than, uh, than, than some of our other, uh, other locations. So the one I speak at uh, often is a, is a little bit smaller. So she says, dad, do you know why Humble Church is so much bigger than Tomball Church? 
I said, why? She said, because you're a horrible preacher. <laughs> like, oh. And then they say, like, hey, dad. Hey, dad, isn't it sad that you run all the time and you're still so slow? <laughs> like, so, like, she just knows, like, how to, how to go for the gut. And it's me. I can't get mad because, it, like, that is my sense of humor, like, to a T. And she cut to, like, the core of your yeah. insecurity. Anything yeah, you're worried exactly. about, she's going to find it. <laughs> exactly. So that's the fruit of the womb because, because they're like us, right? That's why we get that expression. Well, if you think about it, the fruit of the Spirit, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's what we're celebrating at this Christmas time. And so Jesus is literally <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit. He's the joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He's peace and brings the peace that passes all understanding. He, uh, there was never anyone more kind to outsiders and to Gentiles and Samaritans and women and other people that were considered outside by society. Uh, Self-control. I mean, he, he endured the cross on our behalf. If you go through it, everything you know he's gentle he said take take my yoke upon you because my my burden is my yoke is easy my burden is light everything you read about the fruit of the spirit jesus personified so one thing we have to remember is once again we're not trying to achieve these things is that the more we become like jesus who is the fruit of the spirit the more it's his joy that begins to act through us it's his peace because there's you, you'll go through situations where you have no right to have peace. You ever been through something like that? Like what you're going through, you have no right to have peace, but it's a peace that comes through you. Um, so I would say like, let's keep that in mind. Let's not go out trying to be more fruitful, but just to get closer and closer to Jesus so that we can produce these fruits so that we can lead from a place of character rather than trying to lead from our giftings alone. Yeah. Before I get into questions, anything else you either of you want to add? No, I, I think that it's just remember that, that that's it. That comes from a daily walk. I know that's simple, but you have to dwell, right? You have to spend time with in order to become like, be with so that you can become like, I heard somebody really smart say that once, <laughs> uh, but you have to spend time with him in order to become like him and if you're just if you're just praying when you're desperate that that the holy spirit would produce the fruit of the spirit within you but it's not a real relationship you're not spending time consistently you're not practicing that discipline it's not going to be easy it's not going to come easily but the more time you spend consistently it gets easier and easier and it just works Amen. well let's uh tackle some questions you guys ready for this ready all right yes so the first one is about the fruit. The first fruit of the spirit is love, and how obviously there's a little bit of tension in that we're told to uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So there's an implication that we have to love ourselves. And sometimes we we'll talk about about this, where you know if you're if your plane's going down, they tell you to put your mask on first because if you if you're suffering, you're not strong enough to help anybody else, right? So the so there is the importance of self-love, self-care. But the question is about how do we how do we know whenever we're too focused on self-care, self-love? Because it's easy to say, like, if I'm not taking care of myself, then it's going to be hard for me to take care of you. But how do we know when we're, we are too focused on loving ourselves? And you may, the examples they gave is, you know, whenever we you know, we fill our own refrigerators with the best food, but have no money to help the poor. Or whenever we pack our schedules so tight, but don't leave any time for God. Uh, what? How, how, how do we balance that self-love versus others' love and God love? Could we start off with a difficult question? <laughs> uh, this is actually a really good one. Yeah. Uh, Haley, do you do you have anything off the top of your head? Um, well, I think thinking of this as, as a mom, uh, that no matter how how terrible I feel, how tired I am, I still have somebody to take care of. I still have to put them first, even if I'm tired. Um, so I personally, I always like, you know, people, uh, you know, they would say self-love. Um, for me, I, I personally, like, I know there's a time, Jaren knows when we had a newborn, it was like, I just need, I need a break. I really do. And, and I think that's so important to do and make sure that you don't get too overwhelmed. But 
for me, I really think there's so much sacrifice that you need to give for other people. I think that's very important. If you are consistently filled with Jesus, with his love, letting that cup overflow, like that's going to help me making sure that when I'm spending that self-love time, it's not that I'm going to go get a manicure and a pedicure, which is great. Hey, you know, like live it up if you can. But what am I doing with that time that I am, I am doing that self-love? Like, how am I filling my cup back up? I think that that's really important. Does that kind of mm-hmm. go yeah. along with the line of it? I think that we are kind of in this moment culturally where we are obsessed a little bit with self-care. In other words, yeah, self-care, self-love self-service and i think a great way to measure whether you're being effective in terms of how you love people comes from this are you serving yourself more than you're serving other people because jesus didn't have to come to serve a lost and dying world but he did and he served a lost and dying world more than he served himself so I think that if we're just just a great starting point would be, hey, just keep it in check, keep it in balance. If you're going to serve yourself, serve others equally. But I think that, like you just said, if there if there is if you've got all the best foods in your fridge, if you've got the biggest TV in your house, and you know you're Scrooge to everyone else, chances are you are first on your list. And if you are first on your list and you say, well, that's the way it has to be in order for me to love other people properly, I think we might have a misaligned biblical view of what true biblical Christ-like love is. Um, so I would just say, maybe associate love with service. How, how are you serving yourself? And in turn, how are you serving others? And if your life is all about serving you first, I've heard people say this, Oh, I'm getting rid of anybody and everybody in my life that don't, they don't serve me. They don't serve my purpose. I don't think that that's the kingdom of God at all. Uh, and I think there is a way to serve others, but also keep yourself healthy. I really do. Yeah, I, I would say it's all about motive. Like if I'm, if I'm practicing self-care with the intention of being as healthy as I can for the sake of other people, yes. that's healthy. If I'm practicing self-care just because like it's my it's my preference, yeah. then that, then that's the problem. Um, I, go whenever you get a chance, uh, we don't have time to go into it now, but go look at Luke chapter 12 and you've got the parable of the rich fool there. Look at how many times he uses the word I, me, and my. <laughs> so whenever uh, he has this bumper crop, he builds more, instead of helping and giving it away, he builds storage towers to, to store the excess and he's and it over and over, he says, and I and I will say to myself, look at what I have done. I will eat, drink, and be merry. And so is everything. And so like God doesn't really care if you have stuff. Like the reason why the rich fool was judged wasn't because of his amount of stuff. It was because it never crossed his mind of you know what? With one of these towers, I could sell this stuff and feed this whole village. It never other people never crossed his mind. And so I think, I think that's where it, it, the, the balance, am I caring for myself so that I can care for others? Cause I've learned and like, and you guys are, are, are learning cause you're still, you know, so somewhat new to this, this world is like, people will demand everything from you like that. If, if you're willing to give it, there's never a time, like there's never, I've ne- I can't remember the last time I've ever had a moment where I went, Hmm, I wonder what I should do right now. Like, because there's always someone or something to fill that. So I've learned the discipline of, of Sabbath, the discipline of quiet time in the morning, the discipline of saving my time for, for running, like for my, for my writing, for things that I like to do. But I'll, but this is a good question because I'm always have to ask myself, like, but am I doing this because I want to be the healthiest and best I can be for other people? Or am I doing this because I'm a selfish person. <laughs> um, and there are seasons of life where I don't like the answer to that question, but I do, I do, I, I do ask myself that question. Uh, hey, here's a, another one. Uh, maybe I'm on the same lines, but there's a, a book in the, I think it's the third, the either the third or fourth semester. I can't remember that talks about operating in secrecy, which would go along with some of these things we talked about uh, tonight is like, there are some things that you do that you don't public publicly acknowledge that you're doing you know you don't you don't walk down with a big with a big check you know with it 
with it. Like, hey, here, here you go. Or if you're going to, you know, help someone in need, you don't, you don't, you know, take a selfie with them on Facebook. Like, look, look at me feeding the homeless. You know, um, like there are some times that you do things that you that that are done in secrecy because God said those things that you do in secrecy, He will reward you publicly. And there are things that you do publicly, and you receive your your reward in in that moment. And that's it. And that's it. You there's no reward. You already you know. Uh, like you could have had an extra jewel in your crown, but instead you got a you got a really sweet Instagram photo. So <laughs> you have to decide if that was a worthy trade or not, right? But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like w- w- let's talk a little bit about that. Let's maybe some examples of things that should be done in secrecy and other things where you maybe want to draw attention to what you're doing as a as a motivation yeah. for others to do the same. I think that's important. I think it's the motivation. Um, I want to be able to do the things in my life, you know, um, as I believe it was Paul who said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ, right? Did he? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, be able to live my life in that kind of way that, you know, think if you think how amazing it would be if we could all write that verse yeah. and be like, you don't know how to follow Jesus. Yeah. Watch, watch me. me. Yeah. I got watch it, right. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Like watch, watch my prayer life. Watch how I talk to my husband. Watch how I talk to my kids, uh, you know, watch how, what I do for the homeless guy on the street up here that plays his saxophone. Yeah. I love his saxophone music, yeah. you know, like, do I, do I record that? What's my motivation of, am I going to record it because I want likes? Am I going to, am I going to record it because I want to bring it to our staff meeting to say, this is, this is something that we should do as an outreach. You know, where, where, where's my motivation to help pull other people closer to Jesus mm-hmm. or help pull people closer to me? Right. So I, I think the key word here is motivation. And that's, that's the key. He sees your heart when you do something. Yep. He sees your heart when you do something. Uh, but other people's perception is also very, very important. We kind of live in an age now where people are making a living on YouTube, taking $500 and going up to homeless people. That's the whole channel is watch me give $1,000 to somebody that has no money. And they are kind and they are generous. But on the inside, I cringe just a little bit because it's like, I wonder how many subscribers we're going to get for this. Uh, I wonder how many for me to watch. They're hard for me to watch because it's like, well, does it really carry the same amount of weight? But I think the thing that we have is that he sees your heart. So the the most important element to all of this is making sure that your heart and your motivations are in check when you are going out and you are serving others. Uh, I think that at some level, the, you know, when he gets into this mode of saying, Hey, don't let your, don't let one hand know what the other hand is doing. It's not even possible for us as humans, but it is, it's a metaphor for really prioritize to do these things for the right reason with the right heart, because I see your heart. And when you get to heaven, I will know why you have done things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was just thinking, you know, Jesus says, you know, when you pray, go into your closet. That's where we get the term uh, prayer closet from. Um, but he also prayed publicly enough where the disciples come and say, hey, Lord, teach us how to pray. And there's no there's no more public prayer than to say, hey, y'all pray like this. You know, like I'm going to teach you our father who is in heaven. You know, like there's nothing there's not a more public. So there were times where he prayed in private. And there were times where he prayed in public. Uh, there were times whenever uh, he, you know, like. Uh, went and spent time in the wilderness with God. And then there were times where his ministry was more public facing. So I think it's, it, I think it's both ends. You, you, yeah. you, you pray in, in, in secrecy. Fasting? Like oh, we yeah. have 21 days of, you know, prayer and fasting. That's the right. thing you do with a lot of people. There's accountability. Sometimes we need that, but then there's sometimes when it, this is something going on in my life and I need to, I need to fast and pray and not, and not tell anybody. Yep. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Somebody saw you doing it. Doesn't count. <laughs> right. <laughs> might, might as well eat. <laughs> might as well. Yeah, Chick Fil A. I've done that before. It's like halfway through the fast, like well, my heart's not right anyway, so I'm just going to eat. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I've already broken this in my mind, so and I'm just playing. <laughs> I did have a question pop through right here. Um, it says, you know, is it possible to serve others too much? Is that a thing? Yeah, I think if if we are starting to carry their own load instead of their burdens and we're making them codependent that that's a really good sign that we're that by helping them we're hurting them you know by by always being there uh 
if you've ever tried to love someone, I'm not saying this is an extreme example, but if you ever, ever try to love someone who's an addict, you'll know there is a point by serving them that you're hurting them. You know, that, that, there, that there's a line that they're never going to get better as long as you're fulfilling their, their needs. And there are codependent people in church, that, uh, this whole thing. But there, there's a spectrum where too many of us are independent. Like uh, if you look one line on, on, the, on the spectrum, like I don't need you. Like this is kind of where, I mean, I do need you. I love you guys. But like I would, I would fall on this side of things where I'm like, I'm good. I don't, if something's going on, it, to be honest, in my flesh, things would be really bad before I tell you that I need prayer or that I want, like I'm, I'm a pretty independent. I, I, I handle my stuff. You're not going to know what's going on with me. That's not healthy. And I've had to work through that, but that's who I am by nature. Then there's this codependent, which is like, oh, I'm not feeling good today, Jaron. Can you pray for me? Can you, can you help me? Can, can you encourage me? Can you come over? Can you, can we have coffee this week? I'm just, I'm feeling down. That's a codependency because now everything my joy, my peace is all dependent on another person where the Bible calls us to be interdependent, which means that we both stand on our own and we stand in relationship to one another. I encourage you, you encourage me. We're interdependent. It's not a one-way street where I'm always relying on you. So that's a, a long answer to say that whenever we're serving them to a point that we're hurting them because we're, we're doing things for them that they need to learn to do themselves then we're serving them, uh, serving them too much. Uh, maybe the last thing I'll say, if, and then if you guys want to jump in, is like, let's be careful making that assessment though, because it's easy for us to get selfish in those assessments, and and uh, it would be better to serve someone too much than too little uh, in, in a church setting. So I would be careful about about making that judgment, but there will become people in your life where you're clear. Okay. We've, we've done enough. You agree with that? Disagree? I, Push no, back? Eh, eh, that was okay. No, no, this is great. Um, I think that a little bit outside of the realm of codependency. And I know that there are people that are in this very room that they love to serve. Mm -hmm. They love to help and they want to help. And they want to help leads them, they, they end up spinning way too many plates. Mm -hmm. They end up spinning way too many plates because they want to be helpful. And here's what I'll say. Don't seek out so much the approval of man as much as you seek out the approval of God. Why? He designed you with a plan and a purpose. Partner with people in leadership to say, hey, where do you think I'm supposed to be? Where do you think I'm supposed to go? This is where I feel like God is calling me. Then stay in your lane. Specialize. Focus your attention. Don't try to be all things to all people and don't go, well, it's really going to make the Sunday school leader happy and it's really going to make the, the worship leader happy and it's really going to make the people at the food kitchen happy and then it's going to make this per At this point, you're spending way too many plates. First say, God, what did you design me to do? Then partner with your leadership and say, where can I serve best? Then focus all of your energy, your time. You're going to be happier. Mm -hmm. You're going to be more fulfilled. And you're actually going to be much more of an asset to your local body by doing fewer, more specific things that God has specifically designed you for. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you guys stole the words out of my mouth. That's exactly yeah. what I was going to say. Um, I think in every, and this, there's another question that plays off of that. And that is um, sometimes we serve because we're, we're afraid to say no, because we don't know what God's plan is for us. And we don't want to say no to something that could be God setting us up. And I would just say in every, in my opinion, there's a season of yes, followed by a season of no. And whenever I was young in ministry, it was yes to everything because I wanted, I wanted to find out where God was going to use me. So if I got an opportunity, I said yes uh, to things that I felt unqualified for. I said yes. I mean, I've I've done so many things in my life that I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> but I, someone asked me if I want to do it, and I'm like, yeah, sure. Leading DLI is a great example. You know, Dresel came was like, hey, hey, I've got this idea for a leadership training program. I'll be all online. Do you want to help me? Sure. I have no idea how to. Like, I've never set up anything like that before. I have no idea what I'm doing, and I still don't some days. <laughs> but uh, 
but there was a, but it was just, yes. Now I'm humbly reaching a spot in life where I have to start saying no sometimes where I have to start saying, I would love to, but I just can't do all the things that I'm called to do. If I keep saying yes, I'm not this bold, but I do know a pastor who had someone come to him once and say, pastor, I know you're busy, but can we, can you do this for me this week? And he stopped and said, no, he's a, he said, you're wrong. I'm not busy. Like my life, I have a very good rhythm of life. I'm not busy at all. Uh, and the reason why is because I don't do <laughs> what things I like, like what you just asked me to do. Like I've decided I'm, I'm like, yeah, good for you. Like I'm not quite there yet. Uh, yeah. But there, it, but there is this idea of like the longer you go and the more, the more you start feeling like, Hey, I know what I want to do. Then you get a little bit more selective about that. So if, if, so I think it's okay for a season of your life to say, I'm saying yes. Like whatever comes my way, I'm saying yes, because I, I don't want to miss an opportunity that God has for me. I want to find what I'm supposed to be. But then once you start like honing in on that, then you start saying no to the other thing. So I, I think it's seasonal and stage of life's a huge thing. If you're, you know, um, if you're, you know, at, at a stage in life where maybe you don't have young kids or, you know, your job's not super demanding, whatever, like you can say yes to a lot more, but then you've got to, you've got to know your stage of life too. That's awesome. Yeah. You need to, yeah. Think about your family, what stage of life you're in, where you can balance that. Right. And trust that God can get you where he wants to get you. Um, there's this guy, I don't know if you've heard of him. His name is Jonah. Um, <laughs> And Jonah said no to an opportunity <laughs> to go to Nineveh. Spoiler alert, Jonah went to Nineveh. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't read the story, I don't want to run it for you. The point is that he still got to Nineveh. Now, it would have been much better to get on the boat and go than to be vomited up by a fish. Like if I had my, like the, the first route would have been better. But God just has a way of getting you where he needs to get you. And I think sometimes we're so terrified of missing out on the will of God for our lives. And God has a way that's much bigger than, uh, I mean, trust me, if I could have messed up God's plan for my life, I would have done it. <laughs> but in his sovereignty and in his grace, he's brought me to where he wants me to be despite missteps along the way. And so we, I think we sometimes think of God's will as like it's a Rubik's cube. You know, we just got to get, we got to get it just right. If we do everything right, it's all going to line up for us. And that's just not the, not the way that it works that, you know, he's going to eventually get us to where he wants to get us. So none of us should live in fear of, if I make this decision, I mean, some, you know, if I, if I go to this college, if I marry this person, if I, we just put way too much significance on those decisions because God just has a way of, as long as your heart is bent towards him, he'll get you, he'll get you where he wants you. Wow. Um, I, th there's a, a couple others. I think though, we're about 10 minutes over. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we've handled a, a lot of this. Um, and, uh, hopefully this has been helpful with all the questions. I can tell that people have really been listening and tuned in, uh, BU students. Thank you so much for being the live audience. You guys are awesome. And, uh, Pastor Jaron and Haley, y'all are, thank you for, for joining us. And thank you. Everyone, this is the last one of the year, so everyone get your assignments done. Uh, we've got two more weeks, I think, of classes. Do the two 18th. Weeks, yes, and uh, so we'll get all of our assignments done, and then you get a long break. We don't start again until January 30th, so you get a, about six weeks to catch your breath, recruit some of your friends to, uh, to join, and um, in the meantime, uh, God bless you. I hope you guys have a Merry Christmas, great holiday season, and we'll see you next time.